Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatis 1919, I take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 62nd lecture of this lecture series. Calcutta Comparatis 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of academic study of Indian languages and literatures envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the University of Calcutta. Calcutta Comparatis 1919 is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas. We are organizing online lectures on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields. Your remarkable skills will be a great addition to our team. We look forward to a mutually beneficial relationship with you. Thank you for joining us today. Now I would like to request Purbashadi to kindly introduce our speaker. Purbashadi, over to you. Thank you, Jamima. Kolan Kumar Dash is Assistant Professor at the Department of English, Presidency University in Kolkata. He has been a visiting fellow at the Department of English, University of Delhi, and a visiting faculty at the Department of Comparative, Comparative Indian Language and Literature, University of Calcutta. His present research work focuses on Indian philosophy, continental philosophy, the interactions between a conservatism and liberalism, American pragmatist, philosophy of John Dewey, philosophy of race, Dalit literature, philosophy of history, and Ambedkar's political philosophy. His research articles have been published in the Economic and Political Weekly, Dewey Studies, and he has recently finished uh, uh, writing a research article on Ambedkar and Nietzsche for the journal Critical Philosophy of Rest, published by Pennsylvania State University Press. Some, some of his other uh, works on Dalit studies have been published in Contemporary Voice of Dalit and Bangla Journal. He has also guest edited a special issue on Dalit studies of the journal Shangla, Journal of Literary and Cultural Inquiry. He has delivered invited lectures at the Center for India in Africa at uh, the University of Wheat Water Strand in Johannesburg, Jadupur University, University of North Bengal, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, Kalani University, Kajipujul University, University of Delhi, Indian Institute of Technology at uh, Kharagpur and others, and has presented his research works at the Center for Asia Research of York University in Toronto, Nottingham, Trent University, University of Leicester, Ireland, Indian Institute at the uh, Dublin City University, British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia, and John Dewey Society Annual Conference on Dewey and Philosophy in New York City. I welcome you, uh, Kolanda, to our forum. Uh, now, your lecture. Over to you, Kolanda. Uh, hello, am I audible now? Yes, perfect. Please continue. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, uh, please continue. Hi, hi, Kolanda. Listen, I'm going to Yeah, I think... Uh, shows me that my uh, you know face is kind of frozen but uh, that's all right okay i think uh, uh, there is some yeah, network yeah. issue the left, uh, he, he, yeah. will join, so. he will be joining uh, we are sorry for this inconvenience but he will join shortly there is some network issue Yeah, yeah, he is trying to join now. Yes, he is trying to join. Yeah, he is yeah, here now. Are you here? Yeah. yeah, sorry about yeah. that interruption. I think it automatically vanished because it showed that there was some technical glitch. Uh, okay. I yeah. hope it is better and I'm audible now. 
Um, yes. yes so okay. Uh, thank so, you. Thank, thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks to Pratim and uh, Aratrika, Nima and Basha, all of you, for uh, having me here this evening. Um, my plan is to discuss a recently published uh, published the original uh, autobiography was published a couple of years earlier. But this is the translation of a okay, we are having the network issue again. Uh, we, uh, we can yes. do one thing if uh, Kalyanda switches. Off his camera, maybe we can just hear you. The, the, the sound on way, yeah. the network just increases. Okay, I will just write it in the private chat. And our viewers, please please just wait for a few more seconds. You will be joining us shortly. We'll just start resuming this lecture shortly. Worried about these interruptions. Uh, it, it just disappeared from my screen. But anyway, Kulanda, so, yeah, so yeah, this, uh, this one, is an autobiography one, by. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Kulanda, if you just might just switch off your camera for some time. And we're also leaving the screen then. Maybe then the network problem won't happen so much. Yeah, I think I'll do that. I think I'll switch. We can't hear you, Kolanda. Uh, Pratim, uh, if, uh, if you yeah, uh, if you kindly give him a call and ask him to rejoin, switching off the camera, I think that way the network may improve. Yeah, I think he has left. So when he rejoins, yeah. Yes. I think and it may be better now. Try yeah. to send contact him. Yes. Uh, so can, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, now you can start it's your lecture. Effort. Okay. All right. So. Uh, uh, the the text, the primary text that I'm going to discuss is Vanuar Meghwansi's uh, autobiography, um, uh, I Could Not Be Hindu. Uh, and this is a story about a Dalit man in the RSS who tried his best to get himself accommodated within, um, within the RSS, within the, uh, you know, Hindutva project of building a Hindu Rashtra and so on and eventually found himself uh, falling by the wayside, eventually found himself completely discriminated against and uh, completely alienated from that uh, project. Uh, now, when I started reading that text, one of the questions that uh, haunted me, uh, I had many related questions, but the primary question that kept haunting me, that kind of posed itself as a perplexing question was, uh, how is it that so many so-called lower caste constituencies, Dalits, uh, other backward castes, classes, uh, and uh, tribal constituencies, how do they really feel passionately engaged in a project of Hindu Rashtra, uh, given the fact that their position within the so-called Hindu society um, is somewhat tenuous, 
somewhat questionable, somewhat hyphenated. So if it is a hyphenated relationship in your social existence, in the social existence of Dalits, OBCs, and uh, tribals, and other people like them. If these are constituencies that are considered to be ritually uh, contaminated, polluting, their existence is polluting, um, if that is so, if that is how they are perceived by the uh, Hindu scriptural traditions, if that, that is the way they live their social realities within the Hindu society, or uh, if that is the case, then how is it that they are otherwise so passionately engaged in the construction of a Hindu Rashtra? That is something that I couldn't really understand. And that is something that many of us have often not been able to understand. Uh, at least we haven't been able to find any convincing this answer to that sort of a puzzle, that kind of a perplexing question, as I was saying. So that was the initial trigger, if you like, that was the original point that instigated me to talk about uh, the question of caste in relation to uh, Hindutva project. Now, I'm not certainly not the first one to do that. There are uh, many other extremely accomplished scholars. Uh, I can think of uh, uh, Satish Deshpande. I can think of uh, uh, Ajay Gudavarti and, and many other scholars who have worked on this. In, in fact, my uh, very dear friend, um, Anushtub Bashu from University of Illinois English Department, he has recently written a book on Hindutva as political monotheism, wherein he talks about Ambedkar, he talks about the caste question in some form or the other. So it's not that I'm the only one who is doing it in any way, but, uh, but this, is, this particular autobiography uh, is, uh, as it is a recently published one, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, there is any, any sort of uh, critical perspective that has been that has been sort of thrown on this particular text. So in that sense, it, there is some claim of uh, novelty that I can make, uh, a humble one. But apart from this primary text, I have also uh, decided to talk about two related uh, domains of uh, writings by two extremely important thinkers vis-a-vis -vis this template that I have decided to discuss. Uh, if we are thinking of caste and Hindutva, these are two extremely important statesmen, thinkers, uh, politicians, uh, ideologues, whatever you want to call them. And uh, you can already, I think, guess who they are. One is certainly Ambedkar, who uh, spent a lot of his political energy and intellectual uh, uh, energy on, you know, discussing, theorizing caste in order to annihilate it, in order to destroy it. So Ambedkar is certainly one of our interlocutors this evening. And the other uh, uh, interlocutor uh, is the Hindutva ideologue Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. So I'll be discussing Ambedkar and Savarkar, uh, their writings on caste and Hindutva, through this text of Vanuar Meghwansi. So I'll begin with Vanuar Meghwansi's text, I Could Not Be Hindu, story of, the, of an RSS, uh, of a man who wanted to be in the RSS, but could not be in the RSS, which is why he uh, describes his autobiography, uh, Dalit autobiography, as uh, an instance of somebody who could not be Hindu. Uh, that subtly implies that he tried to be Hindu. So let us just have a very quick, uh, thumbnail sort of view on that particular text, and then I'll move on to the two important thinkers, Ambedkar and Savarkar, and then keep coming back to the text of Hanuman Mengwansi. That's the structure that I'm going to follow in the next 40, 50 minutes or so. Um, so, <clears throat> if you look at Hanuman Mengwansi's narrative, I could not be Hindu, you realize that, you know, Meghwansi's narrative, if you look at the first few pages of the text, Meghwansi's narrative begins with a lot of optimism, with a lot of hope that um, despite his uh, low caste Dalit status, despite his social position as a formerly untouchable, as a person who belongs to a formerly untouchable caste community, not really formally, but 
you know, in pen and paper, it's a formerly untouchable caste. It's a scheduled caste constituency. Despite those social that social position that he is forced to inhabit, despite the lived experiences that he encounters uh, in terms of his social position, in terms of his social identity, he thinks he can be, if you look at the 150 pages of the book, or 100 pages or so of the book, he, he really thinks, he believes that the project of Hindu Rashtra has a place for him. So if you, if you go through these pages, one of the persistent, uh, you know, undercurrent Another the persistent feeling that you have is that Meghwansi, although it is a retrospective construction, as it happens, as a significant stakeholder, no matter how tiny it is otherwise, in terms of his position within the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, within the RSS, he's probably a, a low-ranked uh, 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 you know, karyakarta of the RSS. But that doesn't really matter to him. He thinks that whatever tiny contribution that he is uh, you know, passionately making in this project of building Hindu Rashtra has some significance for him, has enormous significance for him, rather. Uh, so when he chants the Ekan Mata Mantra uh, in the RSS every day um, in, in the Bhilwara region of Rajasthan, he is preoccupied with this image of Bharat Mata. In fact, the, the, if you look at this section of the autobiography, you realize that he is obsessed with the image of Bharat Mata. He is obsessed with the project of Hindu Rashtra. He is uh, preoccupied with his, uh, you know, with, with these thoughts of participating in this project, in this grand epic project of building a Hindu Rashtra, right? So the first part, if I divide the text in this somewhat convenient way, the first part of the text is completely about how enamored he was with this entire project of Hindu Rashtra. Now, one of the crucial distinctions that I want all of you to, you know, tend, you know, tentatively make for the time being, if we have a distinction between the socio-religious dispensation of Hinduism and the political project of Hindutva, then there are some scholars, critics, politicians, thinkers who think, like Sashi Tharoor, for instance, who think that the project of Hindutva is a political project and Hinduism as such, if it is considered as a socio-religious dispensation, then it has got nothing to do with that political project. Now, uh, the distinction that I want you to recognize is that I'm not going to propose something similar. I'm not simply going to argue that the whatever this political right wing, RSS and its political out, uh, you know, political, uh, uh, there are certain political parties which are following that ideology. So in that sense, they are the political avatars of RSS, because RSS certainly doesn't take participate, it doesn't participate directly in, in the political realm, in the political, uh, electoral political, uh, uh, you know, equations. So RSS has BJP and probably Siv Sena and many other similar political parties, which are broadly identified as the political right wing, who, uh, in a sense, execute their dream, their, their project of Hindu Rashtra, building the Hindu Rashtra. Now, we need to unpack that term Hindu Rashtra as we go ahead. That is something that we'll keep doing as, 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 we, as we proceed. But before that, let me just quickly draw your attention to this distinction. The distinction is, is, is to be drawn between that statement of Sashi Tharoor and people like him who think that there is a, there is a very... Uh, sharp but very prominent distinction that can be made between the political project of Hindutva and Hinduism as such. Now, I'm certainly going to propose that, uh, but what I will do instead is to draw another kind of distinction which is related to this but not quite this. 
uh, another kind of distinction between the social and the political. And I will try to argue that the social realm is taking a back seat um, entire project, not in terms of uh, who is a Hindu and not, uh, or, or who is this distinction, in terms of these two domains of the social and the political, that we can make when we encounter this Hindu when we insert the caste question in that. So with that, you know, small caveat that people, now, when I was reading that part of the text, uh, as I said, that, that I could feel that this man is uh, obsessed with the project of Hindu Rashtra. Now, the project of Hindu Rashtra uh, is something that at the apparent level, one is the tenet of Hindutva, Hindu, Hinduness, Hindu identity, and so on, which is a socio-religious as well as a politicized socio-religious identity sort of Rashtra, state, which falls directly into the domain of the political, right? Uh, now, in the first section, he is preoccupied with the project of Hindurashtra. He thinks he can then parallelly, as we move on in the in the uh, textual narrative of this particular autobiography, we realize that Manwar Benghwansi's uh, life encounters too many instances of social exclusion, even untouchability, uh, within the RSS. So. Meghwansi starts off with a lot of in this project of Hindu Rashtra and he thinks that his social position uh, will not be uh, an impediment in this uh, participation. Uh, he can certainly go ahead and do whatever he can in his own tiny capacity in order to build that Hindu Rashtra. We are told that Meghwansi actually wa was one of those Karsevaks who went to Ayodhya in order to uh, you know, attack the uh, Babri Masjid, uh, he got incarcerated as a result by the Mulayam Singh Jadav, Jadav government at that time. Um, and because this is a retrospective telling, retrospective narration, we actually get to know that he, uh, he informs us that the, at that point of time when he was imprisoned because he was participating in that attack on the Babri Masjid, Babri Mosque uh, was to be demolished according to these Karsevaks, he was one of them. Uh, when he got arrested, when he got imprisoned, got incarcerated, there were other people uh, in the leadership who did not get incarcerated, who did not even appear at that particular spot uh, of the Ayodhya Babri Masjid. Um, so there is a kind of tension that he could feel, he tells us, even at that moment, there was a sense of tenuous relationship that he could he was sharing with the RSS and he could somehow feel it but this is just an undercurrent this is just a tiny sort of retrospective reference that we come across in that fast hundred pages or so of the book but we are not really told anything more than that the moment we move on to the next section of the autobiography we are constantly being reminded by Meghwansi that his existence within the RSS is always already a questioned, questionable, tenuous one. How? How exactly does he feel that? He is forced to feel it because of certain experiences that he encounters, that he, that he, that he gathers in terms of his interactions with Rajasthan, uh, of the state of Rajasthan. At one point of time in the narrative, we are told that he is he he uh, you know he tries to uh, convince his local leadership in the RSS uh, to go and have lunch at his residence uh, on their way to a particular place to have some kind of a gathering, and when this entire group of people from the RSS arrive at his village, at his native village, arrive in front of his house, they uh, make some excuses and avoid entering his house, avoid taking lunch directly at that particular place at his residence. And then they ask him to pack those food items for them. And they, would, they said that they would have it in their journey to that particular place where they were supposed to gather. And in course of that journey, 
one more megwansi realizes that the food is thrown uh, on the roadside and none of those leaders uh, you know uh, took any of the food items that his mother and his family members had prepared for them and that hurts megwansi so this moment of untouchability uh, this is directly an instance of untouchability of casteism and and so on so he the moment he encounters it there is this fast fundamental gap that he feels between his existence as both as a social uh, you know socially quote unquote uh, low caste person and as a member in the rss and the 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 leadership of the rss when we read the first part of the text we are also told that there is a regular chanting of different mantras in the rss that include names like ambedkar names like kavir name, names like jativa phule jatirao phule so there is this apparent uh, rhetoric uh, in the rss that it it is ready to accept and you might choose another word accommodate if you like they are ready to accept people like ambedkar people like phule and people like kabir despite the fact that these thinkers these people are uh, um, always fought against social inequalities always fought against caste and so on so the writings of ambedkar would never get taught in the rss phule's writings for instance is discussed in the rss but there is certainly a kind of apparent rhetoric within the rss within their project of hindu rashtra the discourse of hindu rashtra that they are they are creating within that there is some space for these names to be accommodated you can call it a tokenized representation of these thinkers because that is certainly the case but we need to move beyond it um now before i move into my references uh, move into that that sort of phase where i can uh, cite ambedkar and savarkar uh, let me give it a pause and tell you that there are certain thinkers like satish pandey desh pandey and uh, other ajay gurabhorti who have tried to explain the initial fundamental perplexing question with which i began today's lecture what was the question why is it despite given the fact that these people are considered as ritually impure as lowly people uh, within the hindu society why do they feel so passionate about this project of hindu rashtra why do they participate in it why did, do they vote for the political right wing in other words if you are thinking of it in electoral terms uh, now some of these thinkers have tried to answer this question by suggesting that at the ground level the rss and its political outfits they try to bring about a politics that you know deshpande and guravarti they are describing as thoda and politics politics of fission and fusion right so in some cases they would uh, exploit the inter caste differences between the obcs and the scs the scs particular caste community of belonging to the sc category uh, uh, scheduled caste constituency they would often exploit the inter caste troubles but they would or, or social gaps or contradictions or conflicts and at the same time they would often exploit intra caste differences so within a caste there is a uh, class mobility a particular group and the other group is not uh, um, as mobile as the other group in terms of and social class mobilization then they would also exploit that so that is why it is, it is called tod and jod politics and if you go through meghwans's narrative you come across too many of these instances of tod and jod politics politics of fusion and fusion that deshpande and gudavarti are talking about but there are also some social scientists who are constantly um you know rueful about the fact that the rss does not have any emancipatory promise or the politics that it represents 
the politics of the political right wing, in other words, does not have any emancipatory dimension for the Dalits, for the backward caste. In terms of annihilating caste, um, there isn't any enough emancipatory promise in this kind of politics. That is what they are trying to imply. People like Ghansam Singh, for instance, who wrote an, an article in the Economic and Political Weekly uh, where he is ruefully saying, well, the RSS doesn't have any uh, long-term, sustainable, anti-caste, social reform movement or a pro um, And it is uh, so sad to see Dalits opting for them. Uh, it is so sad to see backward caste people supporting them and participating in their political causes. So there, there is a great deal of, uh, you know, melancholy uh, um, among these scholars like Ghansam Singh. I have a different kind of approach uh, to offer in this context. I am not somebody who would immediately identify it as uh, a cause for depression among scholars, as a cause for pessimism among us, people who are presumably left, liberal, and so on, progressive people who do not really go by these social identities all the time, people who are anti-caste, people presumably who are, you know, people who are presumably anti-communal uh, religion, uh, mindset, etc. That is the assumption with which I proceed. Assuming that we are all like that. So for people like us, it, it might be a pessimism. And as I said, by citing the example of Ghansam Singh, there might be a utterance on that. But that doesn't really help us to navigate this sort of a complex interplay of social identity, of caste and religion, and the political identity in terms of participating in the project of Hindu Rashtra. That is why I'm taking the you know, help of this particular autobiographical, Dalit autobiographical narrative to get into some of the theoretical, some of the philosophical and intellectual, ideological uh, discussions that we can have. So, in a sense, Meghwansi's narrative is this sort of uh, platform for me to arrive as, at those points of departure. Now, there is, in this first part of the narrative, there is a, a great deal of enthusiasm in Meghwansi's personality for participating in the Hindu project of Hindu Rashtra, the project of any social reforms movement, it is predominantly, inherently, essentially a political project, right? So Meghwansi, if we sort of uh, try to make it sound a little more abstracted rather than just a concrete instance of Meghwansi participating in the RSS, here we have an instance where a Dalit man is feeling passionately involved with a political project of Hindu Rashtra. And we'll talk about that as we go ahead. The second point to be noted is that, that there is a moment in this narrative of sudden realization, almost like an epiphany, where he feels that he is left out, he is discriminated against, he doesn't have a proper position, in the way other caste Hindu people have in, within the RSS. And he can never really go up in the ladder of the RSS uh, positions, the RSS hierarchy, institutional hierarchy. So, and therefore, he feels alienated. So there is a moment of untouchability. There is a rift between his social existence and his otherwise political passion for participating in it project of Hindu Rashtra that the RSS is upholding and RSS is trying to convince them of. So Meghwansi's narrative now has a point of departure. The point of departure occurs predominantly through those moments of untouchability, moments of encountering untouchability. But what does he do in the third part of the text, in the last part of the text? In the last part of the text, we are constantly told by Meghwansi's first person narrative in this Dalit autobiography that he has decided not to take part either in the electoral politics or in some form that political project of Hindutva ever in his life. 
because he has he tells us this is he says that i am not i'm no longer going to be duped i'm no longer going to be uh you know uh manipulated by these people by thinking that i have a position to to hold i have a role to play i have a contribution to make in that project of hindurashtra i am not convinced anymore by their rhetoric even if it include ambedkar kabir jati rao phule and others other anti caste thinkers right i am more interested in the exact writings of these thinkers i am more interested in ambedkar writings i am more interested in phule's writings i'm reading them i'm mingling with ambedkarite organizations i'm going to the um, you know the the hostel for dalit students uh, the ambedkar hostel for dalit students in the region i'm interacting with many of them and i'm slowly realizing that there isn't any future for people like us for dalits in other words in that project of hindu rashtra that rss is so passionately propagating even among the dalits and backward castes right so that's his realization in the end and in this last part of the autobiography mengwansi is constantly moving into the direction of the social reforms movement rather than participating in as i said either political in either uh, electoral politics or some form of the political realm right so he is simply not interested in that political project so the first point that we noted is he is feeling so passionately involved with the with the political project of durashtra uh, to describe it in that way when he encounters these uh, these uh, experiences of untouchability uh, you know brought about by those practiced by those uh, those castes upper caste members in the rss and then he uh, slowly realizes that if there is an emancipatory promise that is only there in the writings of ambedkar and phule and uh, and kabir and so on it isn't there in that political domain in the domain of electoral politics and in the last part of the autobiography he actually gives us a kind of clarion call not to participate not to be totally obsessed not to be completely preoccupied with a political project of any kind whether it is a hindu rashtra or not this particular premise it is the premise that matters in this context the premise is that the moment dalits are participating in the realm of the political they can have some emancipatory uh, uh, you know promise otherwise that emancipatory promise that promise of social empowerment that promise of uh, you know uh, socio political empowerment as well as cultural empowerment will be will not be available to them that premise has got something certain things wrong is what uh, bhanwar meg once in in the last part of his narrative of his autobiographical narrative and let me just read out that one a uh, couple of lines from uh, meg once his book where in the last part uh, he this is, in this section that the the line that i'm going to read out uh, is from that part of the text where Megwansi is constantly uh, offered positions of MLA and MP. He is given those tickets to fight in the elect- electoral battle on behalf of the RSS, on behalf of the BJP, uh, and local uh, leaders of the BJP approach him to to uh, so that he fights his elections, etc. And he co- keeps refusing them, and that refusal. actually these hartens a lot of his comrades a lot of his friends and the, his friends are also disillusioned with him because he they think that he is taking the wrong direction by approaching leftist politics by approaching people like you know uh, he is all sorts of social activism led by left leftist activists in different parts of the uh, uh, state of rajasthan so he has gone in the wrong di- direction is what his former comrades and friends and relatives believe many of his uh, dalit friends also believe that so he informs us in this last part the last part is uh, very interestingly titled as uh, 
the, there are three three sort of sections there uh, one is about lab jihad but but the more interesting title that that sort of uh, matters to us is is this very interesting title of this chapter the slippery paths of politics so in in other words he becomes aware of the slippery paths of politics and he decides to take a different course of action right and he declares this is the line that i wanted to read out he declares on page 234 i'm following the navayana uh, edition of uh, his autobiography his translation done by professor nivedita menon from jnu and this is this book is this translation is published by navayana the anticast publishing house based in new delhi uh, run by my very dear friend a sanand uh, the, the, this the, the page the page number 234 tells us that uh, he, he 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 informs us that uh, he declares i will always work towards transforming society not government now this is a line that i want all of you to stay with i will always work towards transforming society not government that is the statement that he makes almost at the fag end of his of his autobiographical narrative just before that section titled in conclusion right so this is almost the there, there are some 2 236 pages and this appears on page 234 so at almost at the end of the narrative meghwan see changes his course of action from that initial enthusiasm that he felt not just for the rss but primarily for building the indian nation state for building bharat for building hindu rashtra of bharat that project is now substituted almost completely according to his own words by his passionate um, activism in the domain of the social right so he says i will try to make as many contributions as possible in order to bring about changes primarily in the social society in the social realm not in the political realm so i'm not going to contest in electoral battles no matter how hard my friends and relatives try to persuade me no matter how hard the bjp and the rss are trying to persuade me to participate in that kind of politics that is how this narrative evolves now the crucial point here is to make these distinctions as i said right at the outset to make a distinction between the social and the political hmm? now before we proceed to talk about that uh, very quickly let me let me uh, take a look at uh, vinayak damodar savarkar's writings in order to figure out how he conceptualizes the idea of a hindu rashtra who is a hindu is it just implying that india is to be in savarkar's political imagination is to be simply a country where hindus will be treated as first class citizens and others especially muslims will simply be treated as second class citizens is that what he means by the term hindu rashtra is that what he means by his project of building bharat is it the only meaning that is available to us if that is so then we can probably take shashi tharur's argument as acceptable and say that this is just a political project and that there isn't any connection with this uh, of of this with the social uh, pro, uh, existence of hinduism the argument of shashi tharur is not acceptable for me because i otherwise discern the intimate connection between the practice of caste within the hindu society as a socio religious existence as a socio religious register as a socio religious domain and the existence of caste or you know the the question of the caste different configurations around the question of caste within the hindutva project right so caste is something that is common to both it it matters to both these uh, registers so the distinction that tharur makes between hinduism as a pluralist as a very heterogeneous kind of socio religious existence uh, as simply a philosophy of uh, that kind of thing in fact tharur's arguments are not very dissimilar uh, 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 to to the, the views that are uh, you know narrated stated by 
dinang da moda sabar kar i'll come to that as well if i have some time uh, but the important point that we need to discern here is that that is not the distinction that i'm making and this is an anxiety that haunts me because there is a chance for people to confuse these distinctions uh, but i'll try to help all of you to understand my argument better by taking a look at savarkar's own statements uh, look at these statements so i'm going to read out some parts from savarkar's writings these are taken these are translations from savarkar sangraha collection of writings and speeches by vinay damodar savarkar especially from collection or uh, sort of compendium of some uh, some kind of writings and speeches look at how he defines these terms look at how he conceptualizes his project of hindu rashtra and then we will certainly try to focus on his views on, on caste within that project of hindu rashtra so savarkar is saying that i do not believe in purity of race now this is something that is a very loaded statement he says i do not believe in the purity of race i think sexual desire sexual attraction these are his own words sexual attraction has proved more powerful than all the command of all the prophets put together across the globe right so please note that savarkar is being extremely pragmatic here he is ready to accept the fact the normal fact which is otherwise missed by people like hitler unlike hitler savarkar is suggesting that there isn't any purity of race that we can think of sexual attraction is far more powerful than whatever religious prophets have said in terms of maintaining purity of blood now the notion of purity of blood is absolutely central to how we configure caste there was one point of time uh, in in europe especially in the iberian peninsula there was a concept called limpieza do sangre which means purity of blood and the notion of purity of blood which was subtly a racial concept eventually traveled to india and interacted with the indian subcontinental social practice of varna jati whatever you want to call it and created the you know many modern dimensions of caste as we know it now in our times in our post colonial times right so this this is why i said that that's a loaded statement for somebody like ambedkar to uh, for somebody like savarkar to say that there isn't any purity of race that we can think of is a very important statement now let us also quickly look at how he thinks of citizenship how he thinks of uh, the concept of hindu rashtra for him the hindu rashtra is primarily a geographical and territorial concept but also a cultural concept not a religious one so he draws a distinction between culture and a religious identity although there are there are relationships between these two registers he says there has to be some distinction as well so the geographical i'm quoting vinayak uh, damodar savarkar the geographical sense being the primary one has now contracting now expanding but always persistently been associated with the words hindu and hindustan till after the lapse of nearly 5000 years if not more hindustan has come to mean the whole continental country from the sindhu to sindhu from the indus to the seas the most important factor that contributes to the cohesion strength and the sense of unity of a people is that they should possess an internally well connected and externally well demarcated local habitation so it's a territorialized vision of the nation state that savarkar is putting forward right so he says the most important factor that contributes to this cohesion this sense of unity that we are all indians we are all bharatiyas and so on that sense of cohesion is derived not from any other factor but primarily from the factor that there is a local cohabitation so he is talking about the territorialization of this idea of the nation state the idea of the nation state otherwise is a discursive construction is it's more of an abstraction and it has to be territorialized in order to properly exist right so we are happily blessed with both these important requisites for a strong and united nation uh, domain this territory has been perceived uh, as something that is associated with terms like hindu hindustan etc this has got nothing to do with hinduism as a religious existence 
whatsoever. So there is a dissociation of the project of Hindu Rashtra from the social. There is a complete distinction that is that is to be made according to Savarkar's political imagination between the project of Hindu Rashtra. This is not about a, you know a very narrow parochial form of Hinduism, which is what Shashi Tharoor wants to make us believe in. He is not simply talking about a politicization of a religious identity. Now, please understand this distinction very carefully. I'm, I'm again reiterating, I'm repeating myself. Because this has to get into our heads in order to understand the further discussions that I'll be offering in the next 15 minutes or so, and then I'll leave uh, 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 all of you with, with uh, some time for uh, questions and answers. Right. So, that you know, Hindutva uh, politics of the BJP is simply about a politicization of religious identity. I'm not saying that this is merely a politicization of a religious identity or a social identity. I'm saying that the social has got nothing to do with the political as far as Savarkar's project of Hindu Rashtra is concerned. Right? So there is a distinction between these two. There's a great deal of difference between these two. This cannot be confused uh, with what Tharoor is saying. In fact, as I said, Tharoor's opinions go very close to Savarkar's statements. And that is where it becomes extremely problematic both from a pers perspective of electoral politics as well as from ideological perspectives. So he says uh, that a Hindu did not, that does not mean someone who merely followed the religion. He was primarily a citizen either in himself or through his forefathers who had revered this land as his motherland. Right? So the meant to this idea of the of Bharat uh, Bharat Mata or motherland, the, uh, uh, if there is a sense of commitment and allegiance to this idea of motherland, then that's it. I do not bother about the fact whether that person is Muslim or a Hindu. It doesn't matter whether he's a caste Hindu or a Dalit. It doesn't matter. So social identity is in Sabarkar's imagination, political imagination, do not matter. It is to be completely dissociated from the social. His project of Hindu Rashtra is essentially political in that sense, right? So it is not political in the sense that it is simply a politicization of the social. I'm saying, following Savarkar's writings, that there is to be a fundamental differentiation between the social and the political. The social has to be cut off from the political or the other way around in order to configure this notion of a Hindu Rashtra. Or it doesn't matter whether you are a Muslim, you are a Bharatiya, you are part of what he calls Bharatiya Jati. So after the territorialized idea of a nation state, Savarkar is offering us another vision of India, wherein we are all Indians, we are all Bharatiya, as if we are a Jati. Now, we have a different connotation of the term Jati there, apart from its um, you know more hierarchical notion of caste related to the idea of caste. Caste, by the way, doesn't have any vernacular uh, equivalent in our any of the Indian languages, right? Caste is typically a term derived from the Portuguese Spanish word casta, um, uh, which is why I referred to the Iberian Peninsula, talked about limpieza do sangre, talked about the purity of blood notion, etc. So the point is that this is there is a there is a fundamental disconnect that we need to recognize between the social and the political when it comes to Savarkar. And then look at how he engages with the caste question, with which we will slowly proceed to Ambedkar and try to conclude, wrap up our, uh, uh, you know, like this discussion. Uh, his biographer, uh, Vikram Sampath, in a recently published biography uh, that he has written, titled Savarkar, Savarkar, uh, echoes from a forgotten past, 1883 to 19, 1924. That's the text that now I'm quoting, quoting from. This is what Sampath says after giving us some idea of what Savarkar thought vis-a-vis -vis caste within the Hindu Rashtra. Sampath tells us that we, I'm quoting, Vinayak postulated that the Hindus are not merely citizens of the Indian state, 
because of the love they share for their mother motherland it is because of the bonds of common blood so the concept of blood doesn't go away but this is interesting they are not only a rashtra or a nation but also a jati which is why i said that there is a racialization of the notion of who is a bharatiya and who is not there is no religious identity as such there is no social identity as such but there is certainly a notion of a racialized political race we are concept he is con- giving us a concept of a political race so politically we are a bharatiya jati it does not matter whether you are hindu you are a jain or you are a sikh or a punjabi or you, you can be anything any any you can inhabit any social identity in your social realm but the political identity is that you are a bharatiya you belong to the same political race you belong to the same political uh, territorial uh, domain uh, geographical domain of the nation state which is otherwise culturally constructed right uh, and he says uh, sampath says that according to savarkar uh, he, uh, he, he says uh, some sampath says that savarkar finds absolutely nothing amiss therefore among intermarriages between people of various castes a stand much ahead of its times he finds sanction for such intercaste marriages even in the holy epic scriptures of the land from the characters of karna uh, karna uh, bhabru bahana ghatutkach vidur and others to historical figures such as chandragupta maurya who married a brahmin to beget bindushar ashoka who married a vaishya and harshavardhan who gave his daughter to a kshatriya despite being a vaishya are examples he uses uh, savarkar uses to illustrate the fluidity with which the caste system operated now if you look at some of his um, direct opinions on uh, the caste system and how oppressive he recognizes it as an oppressive system so he does have something to offer us in terms of a social reforms movement but please note like, uh, ghansham singh is right in saying that there isn't any sustained social reforms project as far as the rss as far as the uh, uh, as far as savarkar's political imagination are concerned now there is another caveat that i forgot to mention right at the outset i should have mentioned this that savarkar is often somebody who is considered to be a hindutva ideologue but not necessarily tied to the political existence or social existence of uh, of the rss right golwalkar is more of a direct rss ideologue but because there are inevitable connections that are that can be made that have been made between people like savarkar and his political imagination his idea of hindutva and the rss project of hindutva i'm sort of uh, disregarding some of uh, you know empirical uh, points that we need to otherwise take into account so if you look at savarkar's direct writings on caste uh, side you know somewhat uh, you know keeping that question of the political project of hindu rashtra aside he says that there are seven shackles seven seven kinds of obstacles seven kinds of uh, you know bandhis that he talks about that have actually not allowed the indian society he doesn't really call it a hindu society as such but the indian society to proceed in order to have a, have this modern um, hindu rashtra what are these problems look at these problems this is a very interesting list he talks about vedakta bandi where he is talking about how hindus have not allowed lower castes to access the vedic literature right so vedakta bandi is one vyavsaya bandi there he is talking about how we have not allowed people from the lower caste background to access any professional life that they choose that they prefer right so vyavsaya bandi there is an injunction as far as people's choice in professional lives are concerned so that's one problem that's one of the uh, uh, you know shackles that he wants to uh, destroy and there he talks about ambedkar i am conscious that this is too revolutionary uh, uh, a suggestion he is talking about doing away with all these injunctions that upper caste hindus have forced upon lower caste people dalits he says this might be a you know very revolutionary suggestion but this is something that i want to achieve uh, dr ambedkar belongs to mahar caste that traditionally skin dead animals 
if by virtue of his heredity dr ambedkar were left to do just that would our country not have lost one of its most brilliant thinkers and intellectuals so there you have savarkar having extremely sympathetic words for ambedkar then he talks about sparshabandi this is this is very easy to understand as the name itself suggests it is about untouchability so savarkar is uh, considering untouchability as a sin he says the practice of untouchability is a sin is it's a blot on humanity then we have samudrabandi uh, shuddhi bandi uh, roti bandi and roti bandi is about inter caste dining uh, people are not people belonging to the lower caste uh, groups are not allowed to sit with the caste hindus while they eat so roti bandi is the name of that at shackle and then he talks about beti bandi it's about intercaste marriages huh? the ban on intercaste marriages so he is apparently not like the rigid uh, you know somewhat arrogant somewhat parochial hindutva ideologues that we are otherwise familiar with savarkar is you know and um, i'm making this very problematic kind of statement but uh, you you can certainly register my point of uh, you know my argumentative sort of uh, thrust here uh, the 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 point is that savarkar unlike many of these ideologues is presenting himself at least in these writings as more progressive as more liberal as more accommodative and in some sense more radical uh, in terms of his vision of anti caste uh, activism but remember like ghansam singh suggests there isn't any sustainable project against caste as far as social reforms uh, uh, mo uh, movements are concerned undertaken by the rss undertaken by the hindutva lobby right so these are mere words that are not directly to be translated into reality in some sense or the other that's certainly the case but that's not really the more important point here the more important point here is that he considers these shackles again only in so far as these are obstacles in the construction of a hindu rashtra so savarkar is somebody who is preoccupied with the idea of the political realm the idea of <coughs> a political identity of hindu rashtra the political existence of hindu rashtra nothing else really problems for creating the sense of uh, in in constructing the sense of cohesion that is otherwise needed hmm, for building the hindu rashtra so the focus is on the political and as i have already tried to underline this is uh, to be completely dissociated almost completely to be dissociated from the social in the social realm you can do whatever you want you are, can be you can become whatever you want you are what you are doesn't matter but the political realm becomes a realm where you can participate and you can contribute and therefore there is a sense of being a stakeholder in that project and in my reading that is one of the reasons why these dalits and other backward caste people are falling for the temptation to participate both electorally and otherwise in that project of hindu rashtra right not just to vote for them but also to ideologically think along that line because this is this comes more as both a temptation as well as a com compensation for whatever in the social life so in your social life you are uh, to to use that prob problematic word uh, you know somewhat politically incorrect term crippled because you know there is a sense of social handicap there um, you you cannot uh, become a complete human being in that sense in an ontological sense because you are belonging to some social Uh, uh identity that is stigmatized that is uh, uh you know that is considered to be contaminating that is considered to be a a, a a a negative identity so there is a sense of uh limitation there is a sense of being incomplete there and that sense of being incomplete in the social realm is somehow compensated when we can think of a political realm that following uh echoing savarkar's political imagination might simply suggest that forget your social identity forget what you are experiencing in your social life you can be you are most welcome to be participant in this political project don't confuse it, it with your social life as far as this domain is concerned you are free from all those social identities but the matter of the fact is it is not that 
it is this is not the reality if that had been the case then ranwar meghwansi would not have had that moment of departure that moment of realization or epiphany when he finally could feel that he is just a dalit he is not a hindu he is not a rss activist he is not a pracharak he is not a karsevak he cannot be any of these he is simply reduced to his caste identity which is that being a dalit right so in reality that social the specter of the social life haunting the realm of the political does not go away it's a specter it's an apparition that stays it's a real apparition in that sense that dichotomous sort of way we can conceptualize it that is the point that i wanted uh, to share with you now let me quickly talk about ambedkar and i'll just take 5 minutes to conclude i hope that's all right with the organizers uh, so ambedkar uh, meetings um, ambedkar speeches um, especially his constituent assembly speeches uh, the speeches that he made as a participant as a member in the constituent assembly as well as as the primary draftsman as the chairperson of the constitution drafting committee he made many important speeches made delivered lectures in the constituent assembly on how to keep this country united so if you look at ambedkar's thoughts on linguistic states uh, you realize that ambedkar is trying to focus on the unity of the country so you might suggest that there ambedkar and savarkar are very similar in the sense that savarkar considers caste as an impediment in constructing the united india ambedkar also says something somewhat similar uh, to that effect he says that until and unless we do something about caste we cannot become we cannot emerge as a nation right and this seems to be a very uh, persistent anxiety in ambedkar a persistent kind of contradiction if you like in ambedkar's thought uh, because in the constituent assembly speeches is especially the constituent assembly speech that he delivered right before we adopted we, we you know gave the constitution to ourselves on 26 january 1950 in 1949 december uh, i think it is in november 24th or 25th november when he delivers uh, that that lecture that is widely known as the constituent assembly speech of ambedkar there in that speech ambedkar is talking about certainly talking about maintaining the unity of this country but he is also talking about the utter mismatch utter gap this deep sort of uh, contradiction between the social and the political he says that this in the in pen and paper constitutionally we are now a republican democratic country and um, uh, we we are a prajatantra is a great country we have created a wonderful text very inclusive very uh, elaborate text of the indian constitution we are going to give it to ourselves this is a wonderful moment in the history of the nation state it is a moment of celebration but i want to give you a cautionary note at that moment of celebration so at that moment of celebration when we are about to celebrate the fact that we are emerging as a republic we are emerging as a country with a written constitution and the longest one at that moment ambedkar gives us a cautionary note and he says that we might be a politically equal country politically we are given equality there is a right to equality enshrined in the constitution as one of the fundamental rights but in the social realm we are an extremely unequal society and unless there is a sense of social democracy unless there is a sense of social cohesion unless there is a sense of social ethos of democracy unless there is social interaction he describes uh, it by using a biology term a term in life sciences or biological sciences he calls he describes it as, as social osmosis unless there is social osmosis unless there is some kind of the social there is no scope for the political equality to survive right and now we are at a juncture in our national lives wherein this gap is constantly increasing this gap between the uh, you know social equality inequality and politically encoded idea of equality right to equality etc the gap between these two is constantly increasing so ambedkar speech certainly has a lot of relevance for our times for interpreting some of the things that are happening in our social lives in our cultural lives but more especially more importantly in our political lives but at the same time the crucial point that i want to underline here is that ambedkar is thinking of the social and the political unlike savarkar this is the technical point that we need to take note of unlike savarkar
Okay, I think uh, we are facing some tech uh, network issue. Uh, yes, Jemima. Uh, I think we are facing some technical issues. Sir, could you please uh, rejoin the uh, link? I think that way it can get better. Kolanka, can you hear us? I think you can give him a call as well. Okay, we'll we'll try. Yeah. We are facing some network problem. Kindly bear with us. He will be joining shortly. Uh, yes, sir. I just spoke to Kolanda. You'll be joining within a minute. Thank you for bearing with us. I think he has joined. Am I audible now? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're audible, audible. Yeah. But I think the camera position, okay, okay. if it can be, I'll just important. try to. Yeah, I'll I'll try to. Yeah. Sorry about this interruption. I don't know why this is happening today. Uh, it's usually not like that. This is part of Indian life. <laughs> but anyway, am I? Yeah. So <laughs> third world life. But is it okay now? Am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. you are audible. Yeah, yeah. I think you two can go with the question answer session. Or, uh, okay. Or, okay. So, Olanda, uh, will you uh, will conclude? Conclude the. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to conclude, and then I got. Uh, yes, yes. Please, please, please take your time. Take your time. Take yeah. your time. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just take a couple of minutes and conclude. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, I was please. saying that in the Constituent Assembly. In the, in the Constituent Assembly speech that Ambedkar makes in 1949, um, if we take that as an instance of how he thinks of the social and the political, it is very clear that he considers these two realms as deeply connected, unlike, unlike Savarkar. And ultimately, for Ambedkar, it remains a contradiction for a long, long time. He, he does not directly give us, provide us with a, with a kind of situation where we can choose um, any of these any of these realms as the realm of the political uh, realm of emancipation and emancipation or emancipatory promise right so how do we bring about uh, a possibility of emancipation for dalits 
do we do it in terms of social reforms movement do we do do we do it uh, by bringing about something in the realm of the social or do we do we execute that do we bring that about in the political realm by participating in electoral politics but also broadly speaking in the you know larger political uh, constitutional political uh, domain uh, so these are the two avenues that are available to dalits that are that are available to uh, us uh, for the social empowerment of dalits for annihilating caste etc and ambedkar is somebody who certainly fought throughout his life for gaining political rights for attaining political empowerment for dalits so there is no doubt about the fact that ambedkar is a deeply political person is committed to that politics that emancipatory politics that wants to bring about uh, you know social empowerment for dalits but at the same time there is also this very solid um, you know paradigm in his thinking that is overwhelmingly tied to the idea of the social as the primary location through which we can uh, where we can bring about this emancipatory promise emancipatory dimension uh, through which dalits will be empowered more in in a more sustainable way right so i am suggesting that in savarkar there is a uh, fundamental distinction that has to be made between the social and the political and they are not to be connected with each other in his political imagination in reality that is not the case as we see it in bhanu mangan uh, uh, we can see that the social constantly haunts the political which is why he has his moment of realization that rss does not have any anything to offer to him and people like him and thirdly i'm suggesting following ambedkar's speech in the constituent assembly that ambedkar is somebody who is bothered subtly bothered about the political subtly bothered about the unity of the country uh, and he thinks caste is an impediment just as savarkar thinks along that line but at the same time theoretically at least there is a great deal of difference between savarkar and ambedkar in the way they conceptualize the relationship or the lack of it between the social and the political unlike savarkar ambedkar thinks that the social is some, something that not only haunts the political but will determine the political right so social the realm of the social has a determining role to play as far as the political realm is concerned i think that is an important lesson that we get from ambedkar and perhaps that is the reason why at the end of the autobiographical narrative bhanwar meghwansi takes the social route not the political one right i think i can stop here and invite questions uh, i could i could extend it further by bringing in hana arend but i i don't think you know we we have that much of time so uh, if there is a question on that because i am recently this lecture is based on a recently written uh, book chapter on uh, on bhanwar meghwansi's autobiographical narrative that's going to get published with uh, sage um and i wrote that for a book that uh, anindo purakasta is uh, editing so it's part of that project but I, it's also a constantly uh, you know uh, evolving pr project in some sense because i i see it as a work in progress uh, that was an opportunity that anindo da gave for me it was an opportunity to think through these questions uh, and as a result i wrote that book chapter that is uh, going to get published but i also think that these are questions that will stay with me for some time and i might come out, come out with some other writings some other further developments in this, in the arguments that i initially made in that book chapter and i already see those things coming in my lectures so this is the second uh, talk or probably third not really second talk on this particular topic that i am delivering in a public domain and i already include certain texts and references that are not really not part of my my original con to that edited volume so yeah with that note i i'll just for the interruptions yes yes uh, so we if, can understand kolanda if you have qu questions yes, please uh, feel free to we, uh, we have some uh, questions yeah. from our audience uh, should i read them out to you uh, the first question is from keshav bansal uh, keshav is asking yeah, uh, why do you better. think the artists is... yeah yes uh, the first question is from keshav bansal yeah. keshav is asking 
Why do you think the RSS has been able to appropriate anti-caste thinkers and use them to its advantage? Okay, should I answer now? Yes, Kulana, please go ahead. Okay. No, I don't think... Uh... I, I don't think uh, you know Ambedkar anti caste thinkers like Ambedkar can be appropriated. What the political right wing, uh, the BJP and other other right wing political parties are doing, essentially, is to drop the name of Ambedkar, to drop the name of Fule, to mention their names, to have their portraits, their posters uh, in the background in their in, in in their political rallies and so on. Uh, but there isn't any possibility for them to appropriate Ambedkar in terms of his writings. Now, I'm making a very categorical point here. I'm saying that in terms of image making, they might simply have a photograph of Ambedkar uh, with it as an appropriation of Ambedkar. Then that is for you to interpret in that way. I am not going to interpret it as appropriation. So in their rhetoric, as I said in the in the autobiographical narrative that I was discussing, Manwar Mengwansi's text, there are too many references where uh, we see that uh, the RSS mantras include names like Ambedkar, Savarkar, Ambedkar, uh, Fule, and uh, Kabir, and so on. So name dropping is certainly the case uh, as far as appropriating quote unquote appropriating is concerned, but. Ultimately, to appropriate Ambedkar's writings is a completely impossible task, in my opinion. And this is not just my opinion. There are other Ambedkar scholars. Uh, for instance, I have a very good friend, Aishwari Kumar, who recently wrote a book called, not recently, it was published in 2016, uh, Radical Equality. Where, uh, and in the con context of discussing that book, in one of his interviews, uh, Aishwari is saying that the RSS or the BJP cannot really appropriate Ambedkar in a technical sense in terms of his writings categorically, right? Because his writings are completely against the politics of the BJP and the RSS. If you have to follow the Hindutva ideologue, and if you are following R uh, Ambedkar's writings, if you are reading them, then Ambedkar is completely going against all of them. The entire rhetoric of Hindutva politics and the rhetoric of Ambedkarite politics are completely incompatible with each other, right? So I don't think RSS can appropriate Ambedkar. What they can do is to just have a token uh, presence of Ambedkar in terms of a photograph or a poster and, and a portrait or a statue and so on, but nothing beyond it, right? So appropriating Ambedkar's writings or Ambedkar's thoughts, that is not an easy task to do. And uh, interestingly, that doesn't really matter to these RSS and uh, the political right wing, which is exactly the perplexing question I was discussing, that then what is it that draws them to that kind of politics? Now, that question can only be answered by suggesting, as I did, that these people are drawing, being drawn, they are getting attracted to a political project. And they see it primarily as a political project. Of course, there is a su su simultaneous uh, politics or of manipulation which tries to uh, make these Dalits and up, uh, up other backward castes believe that they are all Hindus and they are not backward castes, they are not Dalits. They are all Hindus. Of course, that politics is also there. I am not undermining the role of that politics. And of course, there is a discourse of creating a monotheist, monotheistic sort of idea of Hinduism mm. that Anushtuddha is describing as political monotheism. That is certainly the case. But in that reading that I tried to share with you, I am trying to suggest that the, this distinction between the social and the political actually creates a possibility for these Dalits to feel passionately involved in the political project of Hindutva, to vote for uh, BJP and so on, but at the same time struggling in their social lives. So social inequalities keep haunting them, they are struggling with that, but at the same time it as if it is a compensation for them. Oh, you cannot participate in your social life, there you are a Dalit, there you are an untouchable, but you are not an untouchable, you are not a Dalit as far as the 
slogan of Jai Sri Ram is concerned, as far as the politics of Hindutva is concerned. There you are free to do whatever you want. And you will be considered as a stakeholder, as an equal participant. Right? So that's the feeling that we get. That's what I was talking about. Yes, Arthrika, is there any other question? Yeah, there are a few number of questions. Uh, the next question is by Ramya Raj. Uh, Ramya is asking, uh, do the autobiographies of Dalits really brings out their undergone agonies? <coughs> if not, what are the other means to experience the sufferings more effective? effectively, I guess? Sorry, I, I, uh, I think your voice got broken in the middle. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the, do the autobiographies of Dalits really brings out their undergone agonies? If not, what are the other means to experience their sufferings more effectively? I think she means to say express their sufferings more effectively. Maybe uh, maybe uh, Ramya is talking about other genres. Other, sure. I don't know. Uh, I... I didn't really get the entire question. You know, got, voice got broken, Arthrika. If, if you could repeat what she has. Uh, I think uh, uh, she means like. Uh, how do the autobiographies, I mean, how do the autobiographies of the Dalits really brings out their underground agonies? If not, what are the other means to experience their sufferings more effectively? I don't know if she, uh, by other means, if she means other literary genres or other mediums. Uh, yeah, right. I, yeah, I don't really understand the question, but I'll try to answer it anyway. Uh, I think she's talking about other possibilities, other, other possible avenues through which uh, mm. their uh, sufferings can be more effectively narrated or communicated to the rest of the society and does bring about some emancipatory politics if that is possible at all. If, I think that is the kind of question that she's trying to ask. Yes, so I'll yes. take that question in that sense and I'll try to answer accordingly. I think... Uh, uh, to push it back to my initial uh, argumentative arc that, that I tried to share with all of you through today's talk, I think uh, the, the very idea of expressing your sufferings and uh, struggles through autobiographical narratives of any kind, it can be a autobi an autobiographical novel as well, it, it can be just an autobiographical narrative, a non-fictional work, autobiographical. If that is the trope through which it is being narrated, is it really a very effective way of narr narrating one's struggles and sufferings? That is the question. I think you know it is a very e effective way of doing it because this kind of uh, articulation falls within the domain of the imagine. So when we read these texts, there is also kind of imaginative aesthetic education that we participate in through which we realize that this is how this, these social experiences occur and they get mediated in these narratives um, and the other possibility is to go for the, the, the political solutions to uh, you know not just narrate these uh, writings uh, the, the sufferings through these narratives but also to go out in the political world and make a political argument or a political solution out of these narr narratives of sufferings i think both of these two things are happening at the same time we do not have to think of autobiography as the primary uh, method of narration or genre of expression expressing these sufferings and struggles. There are other uh, domains as well. If you are thinking of other literary genres, for instance, short stories, we also have short stories and novels through which these sufferings are narrated, uh, written down in them. Uh, but, but then again, these are not autobiographical, strictly speaking, autobiographical narratives. So there are other literary genres through which these sufferings can be narrated and they are being narrated, as I said. And there is also another domain through which these sufferings can get communicated to the rest of the world, which is the domain of politics. Now, whether politics is more effective and not these autobiographical narratives that are effective, I am nobody to suggest anything on that. I can't pass any conclusive statement on it. 
but i think there is a simultaneity of all these different domains and methods of narrating one sufferings vis-a-vis -vis caste and caste based uh, discriminatory practices in our society yeah any other question arthur uh arthrikati kindly unmute yourself sorry sorry yeah we have question for pratim pratim is asking uh, do you think savarkar used the term hindutva to emphasize his distinctiveness from the world hinduism and the second part of his question is uh, the main purpose of which maybe was construction of a collective identity but later hindu nationalist ideology ideologies transform the hindutva into a strategy to exclude non hindus and to widen their way even his idea of punya bhumi <coughs> is something different which sang parivar promotes in a different manner what i have learned today maybe the cultural nationalism sang parivar is using have little to do with savarkar's idea correct me if i am wrong again thank you for this fascinating talk Okay. Uh, so this is his so initial question. Actually, in a different yeah. manner, the idea of punna bhumi. What I have learned today, maybe the cultural nationalism. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I I think I can see Pratim's question quite. Yes, Pratim. Uh, question. Clearly on my screen, so I'll answer Pratim's okay, question okay. because I think there is a lot of technical glitch in terms of our internet connection connectivity, and uh, this is becoming very you know annoying uh, at no, times. So that. I will. I think I'll address Pratim's question and then uh, uh, try to come to this conclusion of this today's talk. Uh, Pratim's question is interesting. No, I think Hindutva. Uh, is subtly he is trying to draw probably uh, trying to impress distinction between these two conceptualizations one is the conceptualization of hinduism and the other one is hindutva in fact if you look at uh, sabarkar's writings uh, pratim there is a great deal of reference to the sanatan dharma the, something that you also come across in vivekananda's writings something that you come across in bankim's writings in other writings as well where uh, of the nationalist people nationalist thinkers or politicians you can come across it the same argument in many other writings which is also something that you find in uh, shashi tharur's writings that there is something called a sanatan dharma a kind of ur religion something like a a kind of monotheistic religious dispensation uh, that is the essence of hinduism which he wants to describe as sanatan dharma so there is also a great deal of attention that he pays to the conceptualization of hinduism but certainly at the level of the politic political realm he is drawing a distinction between these to by use you know, other than the term hinduism so there is a there is a distinction that he implies um, and probably also emphasizes the problem yeah uh, <clears throat> is there any other uh, question uh, or uh, i, I think we should, so... we should just you know wrap up <laughs> okay okay uh, can you take one last question if we have one or otherwise we as you if you have time we can take one last question yeah Uh, yeah so no no uh, i have plenty of time it's just that, that it's becoming very uh, you know and not yeah 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 this internet connectivity that. is becoming a problem yeah. that's what i'm talking about yeah, i, 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 I think we enough, can wrap uh, up the session now did you to answer all the questions okay so we can go with this last question and then wrap up the session the question i just showed here now so uh, yeah, shik tarik ali yes he is asking uh, in this time of social and political turmoil when many of our friends in higher education institutions are waiting for the right wing party to come to power in bengal how do you see the future of higher education in the state how do you see the future of literature studies in particular i think it's a very important question in this it is uh, it is it is an extremely important question uh, thank you tarik for asking it but 
Um, well, there are different ways through which we need to uh, approach this problem. Uh, one is certainly the institutionalized space that we are now now seeing constantly getting evolved and changed uh, in the negative direction, subtly. Uh, and it is becoming increasingly difficult for people like us to talk about these issues within the academic institutionalized sort of space. And Calcutta Comparatist is a wonderful alternative platform, I would say, that can actually create an, uh, an alternative space for these kind of discussion, the institutionalized spaces of universities and colleges. So uh, one, uh, probably one way of uh, dealing with this problem, and I actually don't disagree with your question. So I agree with what you are saying, your anxieties. I share those anxieties and concerns. And with that note, I would like to suggest some of the solutions or some of the strategies that we can have. One way of uh, maintaining our commitment to social reforms and as well as our commitment to intellectual works like these, uh, I think we can certainly create these alternative platforms like Calcutta Comparatists. It is uh, institutionalized sort of uh, uh, it, it doesn't fall within the institutionalized space of the university in that sense, strictly speaking. Um, so independent researchers can gather, can put together a platform and through that we can talk about these issues. Um, and virtual platform can be a very good one without these technical glitches that we have been encountering ever since I started speaking to, in today's talk. But, but uh, apart from that, I think it's a good uh, platform to do these things, to sort of bypass the control that the state wants to uh, exert upon all of us. But at the same time, there isn't any easy way of going beyond that sort of uh, ladder of the state. Uh, we are afraid. Uh, are being put under surveillance. So there is this constant anxiety of being under surveillance that we are all suffering from. So I, I agree with your anxieties. Uh, literary studies uh, can uh, has actually started changing in the last 20 years or so. If you look at the syllabus of the, uh, or even in some cases, departments, I think there have been too many interesting positive changes that have occurred. People have started talking about caste, people have started talking to these things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there is this institutionalized uh, uh, surveillance that we are all scared of in some sense. As far as the future of literary studies is concerned, I think those positive changes that we have been able to make in the last 30 years or 20 years or 10 years or so, uh, in terms of these changes that have been made to the syllabus, um, I remember my own experiences of introducing the literature uh, some of us framed in, at the, uh, in, in, in 2012 and 13 around that time. So the new syllabus that we prepared from the uh, very narrow definition of literary studies to, to a broader domain of cultural studies. So I don't, uh, I don't have any problem in accommodating as much uh, of, you know, cultural studies within literary studies. Um, I think that's a very positive change that has occurred. Um, and these days, some of us, I, I was having a conversation with the Central University, very renowned academic of Okay. Sir, do we have you with us? Showing uh, Kalanda is in the screen, but I think he is not able to connect with us. Connecting from some other device, I guess. Okay. You know, on some days we have such good networks, and on 
when talking about discussing this kind of important topics network is like yes such an important topic yes and talking about such an important discussion is going on and so bad timings uh, yes kolanda is back with us Uh, so we cannot hear you. Jibaima, should we turn our camera off so that maybe he will not yeah, be having? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can shut for a second. Yeah. Yeah, Kulanda, we cannot hear you. I have asked uh, Pratim to contact with him. Uh, yeah. Just trying to reconnect from some another other device, I guess. Yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. My response to Tariq, I think literary studies is slowly getting, you know, uh, evolved in a direction where we can, uh, you know, do away with literature, language specific literature departments. That is to say, Bengali department, English department, Hindi department. <coughs> and comparative literature certainly has a great deal of future for us. Um, but at the same time, we are entering a domain of cultural studies uh, through which we can reconfigure the template of literary studies by suggesting that let us just do away with some of these language literature departments in the way Nairobi debate happened. And I'm sure Tariq knows it quite well, uh, you know, the, what, what transpired during the Nairobi debate in Africa. So that kind of thing is one of the possibilities that I see. And through that, probably we might be able to, at least in the level, at the level of, you know, whatever academic contributions we make, we might actually be able to bypass some of those uh, met mechanisms of surveillance that the state puts us under, because then it becomes a much domain and difficult to control. Uh, if it is simply about a specific language, specific literature department, then it comes under the direct radar of this, these departments. But this also, uh, you know, uh, becomes very difficult for us to conceptualize because we are not trained in that way. Uh, we think of our departments uh, in terms of languages. Um, uh, the literature departments are perceived as language specific departments. So I don't know whether it is very feasible, but that's another way through which we can uh, in broaden our scope of our scope of discussions and uh, that's one way of looking at it uh, as far as the state surveillance is concerned as far as the negative developments that have been happening around us we don't know you know the political right wing is based on an aggressive nationalist capitalist 
uh, rhetoric. Uh, that is their discourse. And within that, there isn't much scope for literary studies to survive and prosper. So it's a real danger. I don't know. Um, we need to have more serious, more sustained uh, brainstorming in order to address the kind of difficult question that you have uh, shared with us. So, yeah, uh, we need to think through it. Uh, hmm, bolo, tomra, Arachika, if you have any other question, ha. otherwise we can. Uh, if you want, we can wrap up the session then because uh, our network is very small. Yeah, please. Creating a very bad disruption. <laughs> yeah. Continuous disruption. Our, uh, the viewers yeah. participants are watching. They are trying to contact us. They can drop questions and comments. We can yeah, all of you are free to them. send in your questions. Uh, the organizers have my email address. You can send your questions yes. through email. And contact me if you want more clarifications on this. Yeah. And thank you, Kolanda, for such an informative topic, uh, this lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll now ask Remaima to deliver the official vote of thanks. Remaima? Thank, thank you, Aratrikadi. Uh, on behalf of Calcutta Comparatis 1919 and its member, I would like to convey our hearty thanks to Mr. <laughs> Kolan Kumar Tash for his excellent lecture on the topic, Ambedkar Contra Savarkar caste and Hindutva in Dalit autobiography. I would like to express our gratitude to you, sir, for responding to us and coming to our forum. We are really inspired by your great words and ideas. Thank you to all our audience on YouTube for being with us today. And here we officially conclude the session now. Thank you to everyone. And please don't forget to subscribe our channel for more updates on our upcoming lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.